three things that most people do very incorrectly that results in them not winning substantial money from poker. Whereas if they just fix these three things, they would be substantially better. Poker's Goat says, you are late. Indeed, I am late. You wanna know what I was doing? I was big and busy lugging this heavy trophy from right back here, up here to show all of you the Global Poker Award that I won. Can I get full full web, web, web cam here? How do I do this? Let's see. Here it is. There it is. The 2019 Global Poker Awards People's Choice Poker Personality of the Year. One of the few awards that the fans get to vote on. And you all voted me Poker Personality of the Year. Who would have thought? Anyway, it's time to do it again. For 2021, there was no 2020 awards because COVID happened. I'm the reigning champion. Thanks to all of you. And voting's open again. So if you want to vote for me, if you think that I add substantial value and you like this channel, if you like me, I guess, I have a weird thought. If you all like me, head over to pokercoaching.com slash vote right now and vote. I would appreciate it. We're looking to add some more trophies to the mantelpiece because, you know, at the end of the day, it's not really mine. It's ours, which is kind of nice to think. I think we have a great community of people here who are, this is the wrong thing. Oh, we have a great community here of people who are working hard to improve their skills. Where am I trying to go here? I have the wrong thing pulled up, don't I? This this is why you all like me, I think, because it's, it's clearly, clearly a very professional operation. Clearly a very professional operation. Who knew Jonathan had a personality? Yeah. We're using the um, term personality a little bit loose there. <laughs> All right. Today, let's discuss how to crush tournaments. We're going to go through three things that you need to make sure you are doing. Where do you go to vote? You go to vote at pokercoaching.com slash vote. V-O-T-E. Nice and simple. All right. Understand that tournaments, especially live tournaments, have been booming Oddly enough, ever since COVID happened. <laughs> and they are some of the most profitable games to play right now because there are a lot of people in there just gambling, which is great. In order to win in these games, though, you must develop good, strong fundamentals and, and, and you have to learn how to exploit what your opponents do incorrectly. A lot of people get it in their heads that all they really have to do to win is figure out what level they're on and then do the opposite or... They come up with simple tactics that work well against some players, but are not going to work against anyone who is decent. Like, for example, maybe they um, always check-raise the flop because they think people fold too often on the flop. Sure, maybe. What about the people that don't, right? So you have to develop good, strong, fundamentally sound strategies, but also you have to learn how to adjust away from them to take advantage of what your opponents do correctly. And today, we're going to be going through three tips that you can start implementing into your strategy immediately to give you an edge on your opponents in tournaments, but also in cash games and similar situations. So tip number one, I'm sure some of you do this already. It's actually really easy to do. I made a tool that makes this ridiculously easy for you. And it is to play aggressively pre-flop. Playing aggressively pre-flop allows you to steal more pots without going to showdown. And you know what happens if you steal a bunch of small pots? Your chip stack trickles upwards. Whereas a lot of people's chip stacks trickle downwards because they're always trying to sit there and make the nuts and then get their money in. Hate to break it to you. You're not going to make the nuts all that often in tournaments. And the reason you see many of the same players often at the near the top of the chip leaders is because they are consistently winning lots and small of medi and medium pots, whereas their opponents don't win those pots. And if you are consistently all in with the favorites, which is what a lot of people think they're supposed to strive to do. Yeah, you're going to be a favorite when you get it all in, but it's not going to happen all that often. And if you get it all in with, let's say, even 70% equity, 10 times throughout a tournament, well, you're probably going to lose. Do the math, right? So we're going to have a few rules that will make your life very easy. When you are the first one to enter the pot, enter with a raise. You're going to raise when everyone folds to you. The one exception to this is when you're in the small blind where you may want to develop a limping strategy. Next, when you three bet, which is when you re-raise. If someone raises before you and you're going to re-raise, that is the third bet. They count the big blind as the first bet. Oddly enough, it's a term that comes from an antiquated game called limit hold'em. 
Don't worry about Limit Hold'em. It doesn't really exist much anymore. I, I always love whenever I say that Limit Hold'em is an antiquated game because someone in the comment section is going to say, they play 510 Limit Hold'em in my local casino. It's a big game. But no, it's not. I'm sorry. Um, the term 3-bet comes from Limit Hold'em because the big blind is the first bet, the raise is the second bet, your re-raise is the third bet. It's called a 3-bet. It says nothing about the size of the bet, okay? Whenever you do 3-bet, though, Always make sure to have bluffs in your range. Now, your bluffs may be strong but non-nut hands, or your bluffs may be absolute junky hands that have a random blocker, like an ace or a king. We're going to discuss that in just a second. Also, as you get shorter, look to go all in over the top of raises often. Something a lot of people do very incorrectly is that they just call and try to see the flop a lot. But in reality, when you get shallow... You need to be shoving over your opponent's initial raises frequently because whenever someone raises and you shove and they fold, you win their raise and the small blind and the big blind and the ante. And if you have, let's say, 20 big blinds and you pick up 4.5 big blinds, what is that, like 18% of your chip stack or something like that you pick up? If they fold, that's substantial. Is anyone here today? If anyone's here today, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button. I would appreciate it. All right, let's take a look at some charts that come like this for each specific scenario. So... Let's discuss always having bluffs in your three betting range. When you're out of position, you should be using a different selection of hands than when you are in position. So let's take a look at this chart here, okay? In this scenario, we are on the button versus a cutoff RFI. RFI means raise first end. So this means it folds around to the cutoff, the cutoff raises, and it's on me in the butt on the button. What do we do with every hand in our range? This is how you need to be thinking about poker. You see here the hands in red are re-raised. The hands in green are called. The hands in blue are folded. You may say, you're folding a seven if somebody raises in the cutoff? Yes. Yes, you are. Um, you're folding king nine? Yes. Folding seven five suited? Yes. But you do see we still have a decent amount of calling hands. Usually hands that flop generally well, right? You see hands like king queen suited, ace jack suited, ace nine suited. Uh, not jack nine suited, eight seven suited, low small and medium pairs, right? These are all hands that like to call. Then you have the hands in red, which are re-raising. So on the button, when the cutoff raises, you should be three betting with all the obvious best hands, right? Ace queen suited and better, ace king offsuit, tens and better, roughly. But then a smattering of bluffs. So what should your bluffs be in position? It turns out they should be hands that are pretty reasonable, but not quite good enough to call. So what are hands that are reasonable but not quite good enough to call? It's these hands in this vicinity, right? Take a look at these offsuit hands. We have ace eight offsuit, ace nine offsuit, jack ten offsuit, king queen, or sorry, queen ten offsuit, king ten offsuit, ace ten offsuit, ace jack offsuit, king queen offsuit. And you'll see that these hands are actually played using a mixed strategy, meaning you call sometimes and you re raise sometimes. With a hand like ace eight offsuit, you three bet it every time. A hand like ace nine offsuit, you three bet it 61% of the time, etc. Now, if you wanted to make your strategy easier, more implementable, what I would do is I would take ace-queen three-bets, king-queen three-bets, ace-jack three-bets, ace-ten three-bets, and I just wouldn't three-bet any of those. I would call all of those. And then I would three-bet all of these hands in this vicinity, like jack-ten, king-ten, queen-jack, king-ten, ace-nine. Just three-bet those every time. So it's almost like you're taking some of these small frequencies and just putting them into other hands. It's not going to be exact, but it's going to make your life way easier. Same thing when dealing with these low-suited bluffs. A lot of the ace -X suited and king x suited do a lot of bluffing same story just take um perhaps the better ones here and jam them down to the worst ones. so call the better ones three about the worst ones and i think that's going to be reasonable right but notice and i want you to actually think about this and ask yourself button raises and you have king four suited do you three bet that close to every time what do you think i know i do but it's because i've studied these charts a lot if you do not if you are not doing this then you're probably playing too tightly I would venture to say that most people do way too much calling or folding in this spot and not nearly enough three betting. Or if they three bet, they're three betting the wrong types of hands. A lot of people three bet any pair. Notice here though, a lot of the pairs do not three bet. They just call. Even a hand like nines doesn't do a whole lot of three betting. And that's because 60 big blinds deep, if someone raises, you three bet, and then they four bet, nines went from being a pretty good hand to now a pretty marginal hand, which is exactly where you do not want to be. Okay? Notice the hands that free bet very frequently, though. King 4 suited, King 5 suited, Queen 9 suited, Queen 8 suited, Jack 8 suited, 10 7 suited, Ace 8 offsuit, Ace 9 offsuit. 
These are hands that you should be bluffing with a large chunk of the time. Now, when would you not want to 3-bet those hands? When the initial raiser is tight and will 4-bet you a lot. If you're going to get 4-bet a lot, you don't really want to 3-bet a lot. If you're going to never get your opponent to fold and their range is just really strong because they raise too tight to begin with, you'll want to adjust, right? So always account for your opponent's strategy. But this chart here presumes your opponent is going to play the perfect game theory optimal strategy. Okay? If your opponent is going to play the perfect game theory optimal strategy, this is what you should do. And it's quite a powerful idea to know that if my opponent plays perfectly, they cannot beat me if I use this strategy, right? What about rake considerations? These charts are for tournaments where they do not take a rake from any individual hand. Someone says this thing may be mistitled for the a little brain fuel this morning. If this is mistitled, I apologize. You all are getting something that you didn't know you were getting. Such is life. We'll make sure we change that. I apologize if that's the case. We tried a little something different today. Two YouTube videos live in the same day. Who would have thought? Most people go live on YouTube once every three months. We go live twice in a day. Think of the value. All right. So anyway, here is roughly what you want to be doing in this scenario. You have a lot of trouble remembering the details. Okay. Well, fortunately, I made the app for you. Literally. Assuming you're not breaking the terms and conditions of your poker site or your local casino, get out your phone and look at the chart before the hand takes place so you know what to do. Referencing the charts over and over and over and over and over again is going to burn them into your brain over time. You think I can just sit down and memorize this? I can't. My memory's awful. But it turns out if you do something over and over and over and over again, you get good at it. Also, there is a quiz feature in the poker coaching app where you, it will put you in whatever spot you ask it to or random spots, whatever you want. There are various parameters you can set up and you can quiz yourself over and over. It's like you're playing a bunch of hands over and over and over again. It'll tell you if you're doing it right or wrong, right? I've done my absolute best to help people like myself who don't have a perfect memory to learn how to do this type of stuff because look, I'm not any sort of super genius over here, but I work hard. I work harder than most people and that I've learned to make tools that make it better for myself and easier for myself so that I can uh, improve my skills. The website's having trouble. Okay, well, look, if the website's having support issues right now, I cannot fix it. I'm in the middle of a webinar. Sometimes websites do have small issues. I will uh, make a point to deal with that as soon as we're done here. All right, so this is your three-bet bluffing range. These junkier hands in red when you're in position. What about when you're out of position? Out of position is when, let's say, cutoff raises, same scenario. And you are now in the small blind. I'm sorry, I'm taking a note. Sight broken. Thank you. Notice now our three bets as a bluff are much better, right? Notice that the hands that are three betting in position are really junky. Now the hands that are three betting in out of position are going to be much better. And that's because you're going to get called way more often whenever you three bet from the small blind, okay? So you're gonna to want to three bet with a different selection of hands. Also notice the calling range. This presumes your opponent min raises 60 big blinds deep. This is something a lot of people don't do. A lot of people don't call the queen, the king four suited or the queen eight suited or the eight six suited from the small blind facing a raise. They just don't do it. And they're making a mistake. They're playing too tight. Again, there are certainly times where you would like to adjust accordingly to whatever your opponents do incorrectly, but Assuming you don't know anything about your opponents, you should play roughly this strategy. When you 3-bet and then see that small, you get yourself in trouble with king 4 suited when you're out of position. You have to understand, you're not so concerned with playing your exact hand. This is what happens to a lot of people is they think, oh man, I have the king 4 suited, what do I do now? You need to be concerned with your entire range. And if your entire range is well protected because your range has aces and kings and queens and jacks and tens and ace-king, etc., your range is going to be very strong. And also realize the king four suited randomly makes good hands too. But you want to have bluffs in your range, pre-flop and post-flop. And it turns out king four suited is a hand that actually gets to run some pretty nice bluffs. So anyway, as you see here, as Slippery Rock in the chat says, your three betting range is way more linear from the small blind in general because you know you're going to get called more often when you're in the small blind because your opponent's going to be in position. So that forces you to use a much stronger range. People always ask, what happens if you get 4-bet? Well, go through the app and you'll see. You can actually enter small blind versus cutoff 4-bet. And that will tell you what you're doing. And you're going to be folding out all the junky hands and getting it in with the good hands. 
Feels kind of bad to three bet a hand like king 10 suited and fold it to a four bet, such as life. Feels way better to three bet the king four suited and fold it to a four bet. All right. Also, going back to preflop strategies, you want to play very aggressively with a short stack. Take a look at this. 20 big blinds, button versus cutoff. Similar scenario, right? Except for 20 big blinds deep. Cutoff raises, we're on the button. We do a whole lot of shoving. A lot of people think that you need to call with the pairs to try to flop a set. No, 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 no. You are all in. I would actually venture to say you can shove even wider than this uh, because a lot of people are going to overfold to your all in. One thing you do need to note, though, is that you do have a little bit of a calling range, namely aces and kings and good suited hands that are not quite good enough to shove for value. Okay? You do get to do some calling, but notice all the hands that are shoving, all these big Broadway cards, right, are all shoving. All of the pairs besides aces and kings for slow plays are shoving. All right? Let's take a look at this scenario. 12 big blinds deep. Again, straight from the app. It's all available to poker coaching members. Big blind versus a button raise. Now you're all in very frequently with your ace-x offsuit, your pairs, king x suited, and some of your best ace-x suited, right? Also, again, lots of calling because we're in the big blind. Something else a lot of people don't realize is in the big blind facing a min-raise, you do get to call decently often, especially with suited hands. Didn't you say once that you should never flat call from the small blind? All right, Kevin, let's talk about this concept. This is something a lot of people do very, 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 very wrong when they hear people discussing poker. They extrapolate one spot to mean that that is what you should do in all spots. And I'm sure it, you can find a clip of me somewhere saying, never call from the small blind when someone raises. But what information are you missing? Well, you're missing, what is the stack depth? Is there a rake in the game? How good is the big blind? How good is the initial raiser? If you look at GTO strategies for cash game play with a big rake, or any game with a big rake, you will not flat call from the small blind. But today, we're discussing tournaments where there is no rake on any individual hand, right? You pay the rake up front, which means no money is taken out of the pot in each hand, which means you get to call some because there is you're not missing the part of the pot whenever you call, right? The pot's bigger. As the pot gets bigger, you get to call and try to realize your equity more often. Okay? So as you see here, still a decent amount of calling. If there is a rake for any individual hand, you would not be calling. Also, if you're adjusting for your opponents, maybe the uh, big blind's especially bad. You'd want to call more often. Maybe the initial raiser's especially bad and will um, play perfectly if you three bet, let's say. Then you should call more often, right? So there are certainly times where you want to adjust. But again, study the GTO charts and recognize that five-word statements do not apply to all scenarios in poker, in life, or anything like that. Okay? But as you see here, very clearly we have a calling range in the small blind. We have all the charts for you. Like I said, study them a lot. Reference them as whatever site allows. Don't break the rules of any site. And um, practice with the quiz feature. It's very, very, very valuable. All right, number two, don't overplay marginal hands. This is the biggest mistake I see from small stakes players across the board. People ask me to review their hands all the time in uh, you know, support emails and YouTube comments on Instagram, on Twitter. And probably like half of the mistakes they show me are people overplaying a hand they think is good. It's probably the best hand if all the money doesn't go all in. If all the money goes all in, then they lose. They don't realize that marginal made hands want to play medium-sized pots, not gigantic pots. All right, realize that it is okay. It is okay to get outdrawn sometimes or to let your opponents get there. A lot of people are devastated when they have a hand like top pair and their opponent outdraws them. The thing is, though, is when you put a lot of money in the pot, you end up forcing your opponent to have a strong hand, unless they're, of course, awful calling stations. But as you move up to higher and higher stakes games, your opponents aren't going to be terrible. They're going to be pretty good at poker right? If your opponents are pretty good at poker, you also in turn have to play great poker. Let's take a look at some examples of this to clearly illustrate it. So 40 big blinds deep, we raise with the jack 10 suited. Fine and good. Big blind calls. King jack six. They check. We should bet here frequently. It's a common spot where we're going to have a range and a nut advantage. We discuss these concepts thoroughly in the cash game and tournament master classes at pokercoaching.com. Make sure you go through those if you have not. Again, <laughs> it's going to sound a little bit bad or maybe even self-serving, but 
a lot of people just don't study that much. If you don't study that much, if you do not realize, if you don't know that your range connects great with this flop and your opponent's does not, you're not going to be able to know what to do in these scenarios. But if you've studied the, all of the GTO solutions I have outlined for you in the Cash Game and Tournament Masterclasses, you know this is a spot to bet frequently. Now, in terms of sizing, maybe you have some questions as whether or not to bet small or big, and I think that's certainly a forgivable thought process, a forgivable problem. But if you're checking back here on the flop with much of anything, you're probably messing up. All right. So we have that small, big blind calls, turns to seven, they check. This is a spot where you probably have the best hand with your jack-10 suited. But that's not a good enough reason to bet. This is a spot where we have a very easy check behind. Because if we bet and get called or bet and get raised, we're either going to be against a whole lot of kings or high equity draws. High equity draws are fi in fine shape against us and kings are smashing us. So the thought process a lot of people have is, well, I want to charge the draws. There are clearly a lot of draws available. I should bet and I should bet big. But when you bet big... All the worst hands fold that are not high equity draws and all the better hands call. So what happens is whenever your opponent has a better hand, you're just putting in a lot of money way behind. And when you are ahead of a draw, they still have pretty decent equity, which is not good. So this is a very clear spot to check behind. If you have a, like a bad king here, like say you raise king five suited, which you should do, by the way. <laughs> say you have the king five suited and you bet the flop, you should probably check behind the turn. You're going to find that marginal made hands, such as top pair bad kicker, middle pair good kickers, often do a whole lot of checking behind on the turn of the spot. Planning to call on the vast majority of rivers, if your opponent bets. River opponent bets 5,000 on the river. Seems like an easy call. When lots of draws miss, you usually have a pretty obvious call with your marginal made hands, right? We checked back this hand so that we could have a very easy call on the river. Something else a lot of people do wrong is they check back the turn only when they're planning to give up. Imagine what happens if you start betting all your kings on the turn and all your jacks on the turn. What does your checking range look like? Pocket tens and worse? Pocket tens and worse is a pretty garbage range on the river, which means all your opponent has to do to crush you is to just bet. We actually went through this scenario way in uh, the homework for PokerCoaching.com this month. We actually did it earlier today. This is my third time streaming live for Poker Coaching members today. And... Um, it's a spot where we showed if you did not check back some decently strong hands on the turn, your range is going to be garbage on the river, and that puts you in a pretty nasty spot. Some of you are saying you think we should be betting big on this flop. Sure. Like I said, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal if you bet small or big. Typically, whenever you're looking at hands to bet smaller, usually the middle pair type hands are the ones that often do go for a small size, because if you start betting big again, it's hard to get called by worse. Anyway, this is an example hand, okay? Um, on the river, opponent bets, easy call. Lots of draws miss. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. You got to realize here, are we good about 28% of the time? Of course we are. Of course we are. Put on the king, queen, and we lose. But that's okay, right? We didn't lose all that many chips. We lost nine big blinds. We flop a pair, get to the showdown, make it impossible for the opponent to bluff us while keeping all the bluffs in the pot, and we lose nine big blinds. Fine and good. You should be happy with that result. A lot of people in that spot think, oh man, I lost. This is bad. But it's not. Sometimes you're going to lose hands. I hate to break it to you. You're supposed to make sure you're minimizing your losses. Very important. We raise. Cutoff calls. We should definitely have a checking range here. Do you all know pretty much the only board you get to continuation bet every time from out of position? It's two very distinct boards you get to continuation bet on out of position close to every time. Who knows what it is? Type them in the chat. What is the main type of board... You get to continuation bet every time from out of position from a GTO point of view. We'll see who has done their studying because we go through it in the Tournament Cash Game Masterclass. While I'm waiting on all of you, if you have not already, head over to pokercoaching.com slash vote. You can vote for me for 2021 GPI Poker Personality of the Year if you think I have a good personality. If you don't, vote for somebody else. I would appreciate it. Head over to pokercoaching.com slash vote. All right, let's get some shout-outs. Kenora gets it. Chris. Kaloos gets it. Who else gets it? Is that about it? Chris gets it. He's been studying a lot. He knows, he knows a few of the corner cases. It is the King XX boards. King XX are the boards where, in most scenarios, the out-of-position player... Gets the continuation bet 100% of the time. 
Very common spot where the out-of-position player gets to bet every time. All of you who are saying any other selection of boards are probably wrong. For example, 10 high boards out of position, you should actually check a ton. Deep stack, you might not know this, if you raise from, let's say, early position and the button calls on 10 high boards, you're supposed to check 100% of your range or very close to it, 80% of your range, whatever. Um, so you want to make sure that you have studied these scenarios. And king high boards come up a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. So those are boards you want a continuation bet every time. And you would not know that unless you're some sort of poker savant, which I'm not and probably most of you are not. Hate to break it to you. And, um, or I mean, if you wouldn't know it unless you studied a lot and just like looked at a lot of scenarios. You have to look at a lot of solutions so that you know what to do. So anyway, a side boards you are going to check sometimes. And some of the hands that start checking are top pair bad kicker. Is this a bad kicker? Not really. I'd be more inclined to check ace two than ace 10. But this is a spot where I think checking some portion of the time is viable. We check opponent bets. And now this is just a check call down. Ugh, did we have a raise against a tiny bat? If we had a hand like ace king, we should probably put in a raise for sure. 200, huh? I, I, could, I could see getting out of it, out of line a little bit and raising here. But whatever, we call. Once we check call, we are just check calling down. Check, check, turn. River's a king. Do we value bet? Mm, I think betting or checking is fine. I think either play is viable. We do go for the bet. Opponent does call. Eh, chop it up. Notice, though, what would have happened if we perhaps played this hand a little bit differently. Imagine we bet the flop and the opponent raises. Maybe not with the ace-10 suited, but imagine they raise. Now, all of a sudden, we got a hand that is pretty good, but we're out of position, and we're going to be on the hook to lose a big pot when we happen to be beat. So, in this spot, especially if your opponent is aggressive, you want to ask, if I bet and get raised, am I happy? Happy meaning... Happy meaning... We can confidently get our hand all in or play it for a lot of money... Or we're happy to just fold, right? Like, say you have king five of diamonds on the flop. It's probably okay to bet here. Because if you bet and get raised, you just fold. You're done. It's okay. That might be too garbage to bet, actually. But it's a scenario where you should be checking with some ace Because you also have a lot of hands you want to check and then you know, fold out to one or two or three bets. So you want to make sure you're protecting your checking range. Okay. Then you say there are two types of boards. Yes, king high boards, and specifically king king x boards. Not all paired boards are continuation bet every time, but king king x in particular, uh, that's the way the ranges typically work out. Now, of course, if your opponent's range is somewhat different than uh, the GTO range, then that might change. We're going to go through and discuss um, the idea of overfolding, especially on the river in just a second. But before we go there, I want to tell you about a 30-day challenge I'm running right now at PokerCoaching.com. My team of world-class coaches, and I've been working very hard on this over the last few months, and we just launched a brand new 30-day tournament challenge. And the goal is simple. It's to help you transform your poker skills in just 30 days. This challenge is not for sale. You cannot buy this. This is not a pay me some amount of money and you just have it. This is available only for Poker Coaching Premium members. And if you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, you already have access to this. It's available to you right now. Now, if you're not a Poker Coaching Premium member, that's okay. You can actually get the first seven days of the challenge completely for free at pokercoaching.com slash challenge. Someone said that you all were sending in a lot of traffic and crashing my site, but it'll be up soon if it's not up and ready right now. But anyway... Head over to pokercoaching.com slash challenge. You'll get the first seven days of the challenge completely for free. Hurry up, though. The offer ends on just January 24th. Each day, you're going to watch a video of me or, or one of my world-class coaches. And then we'll also give you a quiz to make sure that you are actively learning the key concepts you need to learn in order to up your tournament game substantially. So here's what you're going to learn over the course of this 30-day challenge. Matt Affleck is going to teach you how to study and memorize preflop ranges. He's also going to be discussing in-depth bubble play and advanced ICM concepts. And uh, then a little bit more on ICM, discussing preflop ranges and preflop strategy in general in scenarios where there are big payout implications. Lexi Gavin is going to be discussing how to play the middle stages of a tournament and also how to play the late stages. Various adjustments you need to make away 
from GTO strategies, or not from, from a chip EV strategies to take advantage of these scenarios. There's me at the bottom, Jonathan Little. I'm going to be going through all the key hands I played in the recent World Series of Poker main event. I'll spoil it for you. I ran into a bunch of setup situations, and if I did not listen to point number two I just went through, I would have lost way earlier. It was one of those spots where I kept making top pair good kickers and just kept losing. Sometimes that happens, but I got to lose a top pair good kicker about 10 times before I went broke, whereas I was watching people all around me make top pair good kicker one time and going broke, right? It's a lot of value in hanging around because sometimes you take your stack and you run it up. We're also going to be discussing something I've been working on a lot. When to barrel the turn with low equity. Typically, people know to bet the turn with their best hands and their draws, but when do you bet the turn with just absolute garbage? Turns out there are actually a lot of spots to do that from a GTO point of view, and we're going to be discussing the very common spots in that video. We're also going to be discussing mastering monotone boards when short stacks. Some of you also said here, monotone boards, you want a continuation bet frequently. True. Out of position, monotone boards you get to bet frequently because you have a lot of ASEC suited, right? Which gives you the nuts. And you also have a lot of the ace or king of the three cards on the board, which gives you a lot of really good draws. So that's the spot where you get to bet very frequently. Then I'm also going to be going through a recent $100,000 buy-in tournament that I played that I had the pleasure of bubbling. Actually, bubble bubble it. I think I took like 15th place when 12 got paid. I had a bunch of chips. Then we all got shallow stacked and I lost three all-ins in a row. Such is life. That's okay. Hopefully you're going to win one of your three all-ins and you don't end up bubbling. But that's a-okay. Anyway, I'm going to go through all the hands that show how I got a pretty decent stack going to the bubble and then how I lost three roughly flipping spots in a row. Also, Alex Fitzgerald, you all told me that you loved his video I just released on YouTube. He's going to be talking about how to play big aces, ace king and ace queen. Jonathan Jaffe, one of the most creative poker players in the world, is going to be discussing how to find creative bluffs. This guy finds more bluffs than you could possibly fathom. <laughs> and they work. It's unbelievable. Faraz Jaka is also going to be going through his World Series of Poker main event and another World Series of Poker tournament review. And Justin Just GTO Saliba is going to be going through a lot of high stakes tournaments that he played recently using Pio Solver. He, his name is Just GTO, and uh, well, he is Just GTO. He actually won a bracelet recently. Congrats to Justin. We have a little bit more. We have a few joint webinars. You all told me that you loved these um, dual webinars where the coaches work together. So Matt Affleck and Jonathan Jaffe are going to be going through the $5,000 Seminole Hard Rock Poker Open that both of them played together. Burt Stevens, who was recently the number one tournament player in the world online. And uh, I think he just won the $25,000 buy-in gigantic tournament that took place on GG for a million bucks. Congrats to him. Um, they're going to be going through one of his other $25,000 buy-in tournament wins. Most people don't have multiple $25,000 buy-in online tournament wins, but uh, Burt Stevens is that guy. He's going to be doing that with Michael Acevedo, who wrote the book on GTO Poker called Modern Poker Theory. I actually had him write that book. Uh, for those who don't know, I curate a lot of the books at DNB Poker, the gigantic poker publishing company. And they asked me, who knows GTO better than anyone else in the world? Let's get him to write a book. I'm like, that is Michael Acevedo. So he wrote the book. That was a lot of work on my end, a lot of work on his end, but happy that that exists. And they're going to go through Burt Stevens' recent 25K win. And then... Jonathan Jaffe and I played some hands recently at the Poker Masters in the Poker Go studio, and we got on and did a webinar together, and we discussed various concepts pertaining to all these hands that we played. He got in a savage value bet against me on a four straight board with uh, an overpair. It was good. I paid. <laughs> so like I said, if you're a poker coaching member, you already have access to this right now. This is just included. I'm a big fan of continuously adding value to... Members, paying members of PokerCoaching.com. So every month, you're getting a ton of new content. And this month, uh, we're doing even more. Like I said, we have this 30-day challenge available for Poker Coaching Premium members right now. If you're not a Poker Coaching Premium member, though, you can get the first seven days of the challenge completely for free over at PokerCoaching.com slash challenge. Let's go through the third thing that you need to make sure you are doing to crush poker tournaments. Are we talking about real money poker? Yes. We play for real. All right. Most players, especially in small stakes games, do not bluff at the proper frequency. What does that mean? That means that they value bet more often than they bluff. Their ranges are typically very strong, especially on the river, compared to they should what they should be from a game theory optimal point of view. So if their range is stronger than it should be, this allows you to adjust. 
An overfold, meaning you should fold way more than the GTO frequency when facing large amounts of aggression. Because if you think about it, most small stake poker players don't get to play poker all that often. And when they get to the middle or late stages of a tournament, they're not especially looking to bluff off their entire stack. They just don't do it. <laughs> so if they're just not bluffing off their entire stack and they raise preflop, bet the flop, bet the turn, jam the river, they probably have a really good hand. Let's go through a few examples of this. What is the challenge? I literally just went through what the challenge was. Every day for 30 days, I am sending you a piece of content. We just went through all of them and we're going to quiz you on all of those. The challenge is to go through and do it for 30 days. I didn't really mention this, but one of the keys to getting good at anything is to work hard consistently. A lot of people think, all right, I'm gonna study poker a lot this week, then I'm gonna be excellent at poker and I'm never gonna study again. It's not how it works, hate to break it to you. You're gonna have to study consistently throughout your career and make sure you're staying at the top of the game or at least way better than your opponents. Otherwise you're gonna get left behind and get crushed. There are a lot of really good poker players in 2005 who made a ton of money playing poker and they thought they were the best in the world. And then they stopped studying. Then they started winning a little bit less. Then they stopped winning altogether. Then they moved down and they realized, oh my God, I'm not actually all that good. Some of them studied and got better. Some of them went broke. And I wanna make sure that doesn't happen to you. And a great way to ensure you're on the fast track to success is to make sure you are studying consistently on a regular basis. And if you go through the 30 day tournament challenge or the 30 day cash game challenge, by the way, it's already on poker coaching premium, you're going to get in the habit of learning and wanting to learn every single day. If you do that, you're going to improve a ton. I mean, imagine you study 30 minutes a day and your opponent study 30 minutes a week. Think about how much more you will have studied over the course of a year than they will. Let's get out the calculator. 30 minutes, do the calculator here. 30 minutes times, let's say you do 350 days of studying a year because you're serious. That is 10,500 minutes of study divided by 60 minutes in an hour. It's 175 hours of study in a year by putting in 30 minutes a day. What if your opponents put in 30 minutes times 52? 30 minutes a week. 1,500 minutes divided by 60. You're putting in 175 hours and your opponents are putting in 26. You're studying about six times as much as them just by doing a little bit more work, just by working hard, just by actually devoting yourself to something that you are presumably serious about. Now, of course, if you're not all that serious about poker and you want to just goof off and have fun, then fine, do whatever you want. But this content here is for people who are actively trying to improve their poker skills and, you know, improve their life, right? It is my job to help my students improve their poker skills to the point that they can make substantial money from poker while still enjoying the game and having fun. Side is working fine. Good. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash challenge. Let's talk about overfolding. Low jack raises, bolts are onto us on the button, 70 big blinds deep. We can um, call our three bet, whatever. I would typically call, but three bet's fine. Queen, queen, eight. That's good. Check, check. Low jack bets 5K. Probably not a good bet. If the opponent's going to bet, I have to presume they want to go smaller. But they go 5K. Take a second think about what you do in this spot. Type it in the chat while I'm waiting. The fundamentals course was good. Yes, I have a completely free fundamentals course, especially if you're not already, not already a pretty good poker player. It's completely free at pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. It's a two and a half hour course. If you like that, the 30 day challenge is actually really similar because um, you're essentially going through a lot of content, like you know, 20, 30 minute videos and quizzing yourself over and over and over again. Call, 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 call. Correct. Everyone who said call, A+. plus. Do not raise here. We do not need to raise. We have the best hand by a mile. The opponent's probably drawing thin or dead. Just call. Also keeps these players in with garbage, which is great. Turns to jack of spades. Opponent checks. What do we do here? Seems like an easy spot to bet. We have the best hand by a mile. But we do not. Why would we not bet here? I like a bet. Check, check, fine. On the river, opponent bets 7,500. This is not my hand history, by the way. This is somebody else's. Why would we not bet turn? It seems like a pretty nice spot to bet turn. Anyway, on the river, opponent bets. We have an easy raise at this point. We do raise it up. Opponent jams. PU. Now, I will say, this is a spot where a lot of people will convince themselves, because I check back the turn, the opponent 
will now think I have nothing and try to bluff me. But no, 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 no. This is a spot where when you're playing small or medium stakes tournaments, I don't know what the opponent's going to have, uh, but it's going to be ace, queen, or better. Unless the opponent is bonkers, and they're going to play a hand like queen 10 this way, which you got to remember, most people will bet the turn with queen 10. This is now a spot where even though we have trips, and that's a really good hand, I think it's just an easy fold. It's just an easy fold. It's an annoying fold, but it is an easy fold. Whenever it goes, bet, raise, re-raise on the river, this re-raise is not a bluff. The only question is, is will this opponent do this with a lot of worse hands to the point that I'm actually good a decent amount of the time? And the answer is just no. Hate to break it to you. The answer is no. Oh, man, I hate folding. I actually had a spot like this in a World Series main event, not this year, but a year or two ago, when, where I like rivered top pair and I bet it, and then I got check shoved all in for like half a stack more. It's like I was getting amazing odds and I folded. I was so angry. <laughs> Don't have the anger when you play poker. Or maybe have the anger when you play poker. It makes you feel alive, that's for sure. You always feel alive whenever you bet almost all your money and then still have to fold top pair. <laughs> anyway, this is just a fold. I would hate, I hate this spot, but it's a fold. What the opponent have? I don't know. They fold. They muck their hand. People always want to see results, but quite often in poker, you don't get to see results. A lot of people want to be able to sleep easy. They're willing to spend substantial money to know that their opponent beat them. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. You don't have to pay if you know they have it. <laughs> All right. Ace King suited. We raise it up. Get called. Check. Continuation bet. Call. Check. Bet again. Good. This is a nice spot to continue betting. You may say, are we worried about being outdrawn? I mean, yeah, sure. But, you know, the nice thing about this is that usually your opponent's going to call with a lot of worse hands, and they're going to raise with a lot of better hands. And the opponent does raise. Man, I hate folding here again. These seems like great spots to bluff, says Mitchell, if people are going to be folding out stuff like trips. Uh, yeah, but you know what? <laughs> We are discussing exploiting something the vast majority of people do wrong. And I'll tell you, a lot of small stakes players who get to play poker once a week or once every three months, they are not thinking, all right, I'm going to get to the middle stages of a tournament, and then I'm going to check raise bluff all in on the river, giving my opponent really good odds. That's not what they're thinking. That's not the spot they are actively trying to get to. It's not the spot good pros are trying to get to. No one's trying to get to the spot where they're going to give their opponent good odds with a strong range when they're putting in almost all their money. And then they're trying to get him to fold. That's not how it works. That's how it could work for some people, but uh, no, no one, and when I say no one, I mean 99.9% .9 of players are not doing this. One thing Chris says about the previous hand, which is a big blunder people make, why not just check back the river? That way we don't get bluffed. Because we have the best hand by a mile, I know 98% of the time, and we can value bet. When this guy bets the river... We could just call, but we have the best hand by a mile. So put in the value raise. A lot of people don't go for enough value either. We didn't discuss it today, but um, there you go. Anyway, we bet turn with the ace king to get raised. Just fold. 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 Don't pay. Now, in a higher stakes game, this is a way tougher spot because in higher stakes games, people will have random diamond draws, maybe in random random hands with an eight, like eight, eight, X, eight X of hearts. You know, stuff like King Eight of Hearts that flows to flop. But this is a spot where you just have to you just have to fold against most people. Now, look, you all know me, Jonathan Little, does not like to do a whole lot of folding. But if you've watched any of the content I've done where I reviewed all sorts of players' hands, especially some of the like live poker vlogger hands on YouTube, you can watch that for free on youtube.com slash poker coaching. Um, you'll see that when people check raise. At any point, especially on the turn in the river, or especially when they're trying to put in all their money, they just don't have good... I mean, they don't have any bluffs. They have literally no bluffs in these spots. They're going to show up with two pair and straights and sets, and that's it. So you fold. You move on with your life. It's okay. You do not have to continue calling just to see where you stand. So that's me for today. Today we discussed three top strategies to crush live poker tournaments. You need to play aggressively pre-flop. Follow the poker coaching app. Maybe adjust subtly. Don't overplay marginal hands. Marginal hands are great for a small pot, not so great for a giant pot. 
and overfold, especially on the river when your opponents are blasting their stack into the pot when you do not have a really good hand. If you start using these strategies in your games right now, you're going to gain a substantial edge on your opponents, and that's going to result in you running deep more often. Think about it, right? If you just win a lot more small pots, you're going to consistently chip up. If you don't overplay marginal hands, you're going to sidestep spots where you lose in setup scenarios. And if you overfold on the river, same spot, you're going to sidestep scenarios where you are effectively set up. A lot of people think, oh man, I made trips, I had to go broke, what can you do? But turns out you should actually be sidestepping those scenarios. Again, if you missed the discussion on the 30-day challenge earlier, I'm going to save you the spiel. Head over to pokercoaching.com slash challenge. That's something I definitely recommend all of you do. Head over to pokercoaching.com slash challenge right now to get in the 30-day challenge. If you are serious about taking your poker skills to the next level, the first seven days of the challenge are completely free. You're going to get seven high-quality educational poker videos emailed to you and also seven quizzes emailed to you that will help you improve your skills and learn everything you need to know to succeed at poker tournaments. What stakes is this challenge good for? All stakes. So many people get it in their heads that if people are talking about something that it must be accurate to their very, 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 very specific game to have any value whatsoever, but it's just not true. It's absolutely not true. Let's go through here and talk about these concepts, right? Do you think you need to study and uh, learn how to memorize preflop hand ranges? Yeah. You think you need to learn how to play on the bubble? Yeah. You think you need to learn ICM preflop strategies? Yes. You think you need to adjust to multi-table or to mid stages and late stages? Yes. You think you need to know when to barrel the turn below equity? Yes. All these things. The answer to all these uh, questions here is yes, 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 yes. You need to learn these things. And if you don't, you're just like, you're not going to improve. You're not going to improve. If you don't have a premium membership, like I said here, the first seven days are free. Zero dollars. I don't really know what more you want from me than a bunch of free content. I do my absolute best to give lots of free content and add value to all of you. I realize that you know, a lot of people don't have a ton of money. Whenever I first started playing poker, I had $50 to my name. I was 18 years old, working at a job where I made about $8 an hour. And I would work a day, buy a poker book, and study it. Then I'd work another day and buy a poker book and study it. Back then, all they had were books. There were no training sites. And uh, I was, um, I guess, annoyed at the fact that it was so difficult to get good at poker. Um, so I made pokercoaching.com to be the site that I wanted way back then, but also the site that I want today. I mean, we discussed like the preflop app. I want that. I make tools for me and for my students to succeed at the game. That is what we are going for. Dick says, if you like this video, click the like button. Yeah. Click the like button, click the subscribe button. And if you really like it, if you really like it, head over to pokercoaching.com slash vote and vote for me for GPI poker personality of the year. It's a popularity contest. Do you think I am popular. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. But I do my best to add substantial value to the poker community. And I, I think people realize that. And I think people appreciate it. So anyway, you can let other people know by heading over to pokercoaching.com slash vote. You have to type in my name. It appears correctly. Uh, make sure you type it in correctly. If you have any problem with the website or pricing or whatever, um, send us an email. Support at pokercoaching.com. I'm not looking at it right now. Like I said, I'm in the middle of a webinar. For those who don't know, whenever I'm in the middle of a webinar, I'm also not answering support emails at the same time. Sorry. Give me a few minutes. Give me a few minutes. What ratio of studying to playing should you do? Well, if you're bad at something, you should be spending all of your time studying. If you're really good at something, you should be spending less time studying, right? There's some balance between play and study. And as your skills get better and better and better and better and better, then you should study less inevitably, right? But all every time you or the amount of time you spend playing poker or not doing any study of poker, that is time where your skills are going to be diminishing compared to your opponents because they are going to be studying. So it's very, very important to make sure that you are always studying consistently. At the same time, though, if you're not winning a lot of money at poker today, it presumes you're not better than your opponent. If you're not better than your opponent, a great way to get a whole lot better than your opponents quickly is to study a ton. And I mean like 100% study and no play for a while until you actually understand good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. How do you win more coin flips? Yeah, double-headed coin is good. But you know, FR Empire, a lot of people 
have this idea that tournaments are all luck or poker is all luck and when you lose all your flips, there's nothing you can do. But did you not just watch the webinar I presented? Did you literally not watch the webinar I just presented? Point number one actually fixes your problem. I don't win a lot of all ends. Maybe you're running bad in the short run. First things first, don't be a baby, okay? All you have to do to win at poker is to find a game you can beat, find a game where you have an edge, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll, and you will win because it's a math game at the end of the day. Find a game with an edge, play the game with edge, keep the proper bankroll, chart goes up. Money machine goes burr. All right, but play aggressively pre-flop. Playing aggressively pre-flop results, I mean, let's go back to the slide. Playing aggressively pre-flop allows you to steal more pots without needing a showdown. Great way to not lose a tournament is to not get all in. If you're consistently getting it all in, especially with a shallow stack, it implies you're not stealing enough pots. If you don't steal enough pots, your chip stack diminishes. Your chip stack diminishes. And then you get it all in as a favorite and you lose 70% of the time or something like that. Okay? Simple as that. Simple as that. But again, to win at poker, find a game you can beat. What does that imply? That implies you're either really good at poker your opponents are really bad at poker or some combination of the two. The main thing you have control over there is how good you are, right? So focus on getting really good at poker. Obviously, you can game select. You can find better tables, find better seats, etc. And you should be doing that. But you got to be at least okay in order to find someone better, or find someone worse than you to play with. Find a game you can beat. Play it a lot. I lose all my flips. Well, you literally can't lose all your flips if they're flips. Because if you play 1,000 of them or 10,000 of them, you're going to run at roughly 50-50. Hate to break it to you. No one is substantially luckier or unluckier, unlucky than other players in the long run. Now, most people don't get to the long run. I'll definitely say that. But they're not doing point number two. Maybe they find a game they can beat, but they don't play a lot. Well, then you're going to feel the full brunt of variance. Hate to break it to you. And then keep a proper bankroll. A lot of people play way too big. If you have $100 to your name and you're buying into $30 tournaments, uh, you're going to go broke, even if you're really good, because you're not keeping a proper bankroll. If you're playing $5 tournaments on a $100 bankroll, you're going to go broke. Hate to break it to you. I don't hate to break it to you. That's my job to break it to you. Um, you got to realize, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll, and you will win. If you don't do those three things, you're probably going to lose. I mean, you could still get lucky, of course, but I'd rather not rely on getting lucky, especially if you can't even win flips. And that's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, do me a favor and click the like and subscribe button. And look, if you like the content that I produce here, check out pokercoaching.com slash challenge. It's completely free for the first seven days. If you have any questions about the challenge or problems with the website or whatever, send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. I have a team there to take care of whatever problems we have. I appreciate all of you being here and I hope you have an amazing year. I realized 2021 was rough for a lot of people. I basically sat in this office and, and worked <laughs> all year making content for all of you. But I realized that um, it's a tough thing. People who need community, make sure you check out the live streams. Louis Philippe does Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. And God's Big Tone Crazy Sixes on Thursday and Saturday. There you go. If you are a Poker Coaching member, click on the community tab and get in the Discord. If you go to the study sessions channel in the Discord, they are very, very regularly running study sessions. Super easy. Get in there, find people who are working hard to improve their skills and learn together. One of the luckiest things that happened to me as a young poker player is I found a group of poker players who really wanted to win at poker. We were all people who didn't have a whole lot going on in life. Most of us were like college students at the time or people who, you know, were freshly out of college and trying to find their career. And we had a lot of time to devote to getting good at poker. Back then, there were no training sites or anything like that. So we had to figure it all out ourselves, which meant we squandered a lot of time. But we eventually figured it out. And now a lot of us are many of the best poker players in the world. Who'd have thought? And if you find people who are actively studying and actively working hard, you're, you're going to improve, right? Like I said, if you devote more time to studying than your opponents, you are going to win in the long run if you're making sure you do those three things that we discussed earlier. And I know that um, Louis Philippe, Crazy Sixes, God's Big Toe are all working very, very hard on their skills, and they're all good, strong, winning poker players. So get in there, learn from them. They do a great job running the study sessions. That's going to be it for today. Good luck. Have fun. Have a great year. Don't worry. I'll, I'm sure I'll be seeing you all very soon. Make sure you check out youtube.com slash poker coaching. We have all sorts of free content there. Make sure you get in the challenge if you really want to take your game to the next level and make sure you enjoy yourself. You only have one life to live. Make sure you make the most of it. Thank you for being here. 